while you're standing, I'm going to go ahead and have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for each and every person that is here on this morning, Lord. Lord, I pray that from my notes that we can help somebody, help themselves. Because, Lord, without you and your help, we're nothing. And, Lord, I, I, I just thank you. I give you praise. I give you honor. And we give you glory. In Jesus' name. And we all can say, the goodness of God. The goodness of God. You know, well, first, I'd like to give honor to God who was the head of my life, to my pastor, to the first lady, to my first lady. to the emeritus pastor. And to each and every one of you, you can be seated, you can be seated. And I thank pastor again for the opportunity to drive his bus. This is what I call his bus. And I tried to drive it carefully. He set the cruise, and so I want to keep it just like he had got it going. You understand what I'm saying? Because by him allowing me to drive the bus, I got the steering wheel. And if I went off, I can crash this bus and mess up a whole bunch of people. But I'm not going to do that. But y'all put y'all seatbelts on. <laughs> you know, uh, when Lisa was ministering with her uh, solo, The Goodness of God, it sort of touched in my, everything everybody got up here and said today sort of touched a little bit in my message. Because, uh, you know, you cannot recognize the goodness of God with a bad attitude. Attitudes. Attitudes. I don't care what situation that you go in, if you have the bad attitude, it determines the outcome. So, Webster says, Well, a psychologist says <laughs> attitude is a psychological construct that is a mental and emotional entity that inheres or characterizes a person. Their attitude to approach to something or their personal views on it. Attitude involves their mindset, outlook, and feeling. Attitudes are complex and are acquired state through life's experiences. Attitude is an individual predisposed state of mind regarding a value and it's precipitated through a response expressed towards oneself, a person, place, thing, or event the attitude object, which in turn influences the individual's thoughts and actions. Webster says again, a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something. Typically, one that is reflected in a person's behavior, a point of view, a view, a frame of mind, a school of thought, a perspective, a reaction, 
a stance, position, inclination, orientation, approach, conviction, feelings, sentiments, persuasion, thoughts, thinking, interpretation, way of thinking, the way of looking. Today, we're going to talk to you about a man in the Bible that had a bad attitude. We're going to talk about the Jonah's attitude. This morning, I have a question. Have you ever met someone with a Jonah attitude? I will tell you about uh, Jonah more later. But right now, I want you to begin thinking whether or not you've ever met someone with his attitude. You know, maybe you know them well, or maybe you looked in the mirror this morning and saw Jonah's face instead of your own. In my message today, we will look at traits, ways to identify the Jonah attitude. You know, there are times when I find myself talking with people, trying to convince them about how good God is and how he would take care of them if they allow him to. Many times I'm not sure if I'm getting through to these people, I mean, people who claim to be Christians are the hardest one to convince about God's goodness. These are people who actually believe in God, yet because of their own individual struggles, they take a stance that maybe all the goodness that we talk about with God is only hype. Is it hype? Is God really good? Or are we Jonah's? This morning, I want you to consider the story of Jonah in a manner unlike before. As I get deeper into the message, ask yourself, do I have a Jonah attitude? I will tell you that I've had a Jonah attitude before. So I know what I know, and I don't care what's right. I'm going to do what I think I need to do, because that's me. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And when you take a stance like that, that you know what you know and don't nobody else know, because they ain't walked in my shoes. Sometimes God can't help you. So let me give you an example. A situation when someone is drowning. I know Ella Curling can attest to this. I'm not sure how many of you know what happens when someone is drowning. They cannot swim. You know, they say that your life flashes before your eyes and as you slowly sink. I'm not sure. But one thing that often happens is that the individual who's drowning often panics and begins to struggle against the person who has jumped in to save them. They have there have been times that the rescuer had to knock the person out in order to save their lives. and the life of the person they were trying to rescue. When you consider that scenario, the one who jumps into the water to save the life of the one who is drowning must hurt the person physically in order to save them. Did not do it because they were angry, they did it to save their lives. 
the reason I'm sharing this with you is this. If God is trying to help you and you're fighting against him, there are times when he must knock you out so he can save you. Our Jonah attitude influences us to fight against God. Today we'll look at the goodness of God compared to what I will call throughout the message, the Jonah attitude. So let's go to the book of Jonah, where we'll look at a man who decided to fight against God, lost, and then got angry with God for his goodness and mercy. But before I talk about that, let me clarify something. First, again, as proof of God's goodness, throughout history, theologians and great thinkers of God have discussed, debated whether Jonah ever existed or if this is a real story and whether it's factual. It's also been questioned whether or not there's ever been a fish big enough to swallow a man. Now, you know I like to watch the History Channel and the wildlife channels. To these points, I would submit this. While the throat of most whales are too narrow to swallow a man, however, the sperm whale can swallow a man, and this is a proven fact. There was a case of a man named James Bartley in the early 1900s, and he was labeled as the modern day Jonah. As it relates to the rest, I would only quote Jesus. And if anybody would know if this story was real, it would be him. Who was present on day one? Jesus said in Matthews 12 and 40, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, if Jesus believed it, that's good enough for me. So let's go to the heart of our message. In the first two verses, I'm going to Jonah uh, 1, 1 and 2. In the first two uh, verses of chapter 1, the book of Jonah, we find God's goodness. Verse 1 and 2 reads as follows. Now the word of the Lord came to the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. God looked down and saw the wickedness of the city of Nineveh and selected Jonah as his messenger to save the city. God was acting out of his own goodness and his love for those people, not necessarily for the city, but the people who dwell therein. You see, God is good all the time. He's not like we are. He's always good. He did not have to reach out to the people of Nineveh, Nineveh, but that was his nature. And in verse 3 of chapter 1, we get the first glance of Jonah's attitude. Jonah 1 and 3 says, but Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. He found a ship going 
going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You know, I'm not sure what Jonah was uh, thinking in his desire to flee from the presence of the Lord because maybe he didn't understand or read or comprehend what David knew when he wrote Psalms 30, 139, 7, and 10. Where can I go from the Spirit? Or where can I flee from the presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou out there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there thy hand lead me, and thy right hand will lay hold of me. I don't care where you go, how far you go, how bad you get, you can't run from God. Jonah found this to be true, but let's examine his attitude. First, he was one of God's prophets, so he should have understood that he could not run from God. You ought to know that. You've been sitting around in Oasis Love for 30 years. Six months, two weeks, whatever it was. And we talk about the goodness of God. So you can't run, you can't hide, you can't get away. And your arms is too short to box with God. Also, as a man of God, you would think that he would have been extremely happy. If God calls on you to do something, you ought to be happy. Lord, I thank you. Thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for, for calling on me. You Little old me, you won't little. I'm nobody. Just try to tell somebody about somebody, and you call me to tell. I'm happy to do that, but Jonah's attitude didn't allow this for him. Instead of Jonah being uh, doing what God told him to do, he went in the opposite direction. Now, how many of us do that? I think about that song Jill Scott sing. I think her mind was telling her to do something else and she said she ended up in somebody else's. Yeah. God talks to us all the time. We get, I'm going over here and I'm going to give Richard a piece of my mind. Timmy, don't do it. Well, if I don't do it, it won't be me. I'm going over here, and I'm going to let these people have it. How'd that work out for you? God tells you that he, he, he ain't hollering at you. He, he, he say, Timmy, don't do that. And you be saying, mm-mm, mm-mm. They disturb my righteous and indignation. You know, one of the first identifiers of the Jonah attitude is when a person believes they can pick and choose the things of God they would do. A Jonah attitude says that regardless of what God is telling me or what he is trying to do in my life, I can choose whether or not to do it. Now, in some ways, this is correct. It is. It is. In that God made us with the ability to choose, being totally free to make our own decision. He gets joy when we choose to follow him. He will not force us. He wants us to love him enough, so much that we choose to obey and walk in fellowship with him. However, if you have a Jonah attitude, that would be hard to do because I only want to walk in fellowship with God when it pleases me 
or when I'm getting something out of the deal. You know, it's hard to hear from God when you've already decided what you want to hear him say. Be like, oh, that ain't God. <laughs> the second identifier of the Jonah attitude is when we refuse to do good to someone because of our dislike towards them. In Jonah's case, it appeared that he simply did not like the people of Nineveh and did not want to do anything that would save them. He actually looked forward to their destruction, as we will see later. When we as individuals get to the point where we are refusing to do good because we do not like someone or for whatever reason, that constitutes as sin for us. Sin. You say, where do you get that? Oh, I'm going to the Bible. I got it. I got it. James 4 and 17 says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. If you, if you feel that it's the right thing to do, but mm, I ain't going to do it, do it for the vine. I ain't going to do it. Do it for the vine. I ain't going to do it. You know, this is serious because it is not limited to us just doing the right thing as it pertains to a, uh, your interaction with another person. It means doing the right thing all the time. All the time. If you're on your job, now listen here, listen here. Listen here. If you're on your job and you know you should do something, although you won't get in trouble if you don't, if you don't do it for you, for you, it is sin if you don't get it done. I ain't doing that. Why I got to be putting in all this work and they ain't doing it? Well, Brother Timmy, I want you to go ahead and finish that out. Put the, take the workload. I ain't taking no workload off nobody else. Timmy, come on, come on. I'm, I'm talking to you. I ain't doing that. I don't have to do it. Because it ain't my job. Again, a Jonah attitude thinks we can pick and choose what we would do, regardless of the circumstance. But that is not the case. Let's move on with John. In keeping with the flow of the book of Jonah, I want to touch on one response we should have with our Jonah attitude and when it is present in others. As we have read the story of Jonah, you know that he got in a ship to attempt to get away from God and not fulfill what God had told him to do. The third identifier of Jonah would allow their attitudes actions to harm others without caring. And we say stuff to fix that, like, well, God knows my heart. He knows my heart. I, I ain't got, he knows my heart. And in that same conversation, in that same week, Lord, why is this stuff happening to me? Well, because he knows your heart. You know, a lot of us are going to miss heaven by about. I said about 16 inches between the head and the heart. We, about, about 16, I almost made. 
the righteous shall scarcely make it. When they got out to sea, Jonah fell asleep without even worrying about the storm. He put his head behind his... Yeah, when, when we go home today, just read this story. If you don't believe what I'm saying. He, did, he put his head and fell asleep. You see, Jonah had enough faith in God because God knows his heart. That he knew he would be okay. So he went to sleep without a care in the world. Maybe he thought he had actually gotten over on God, but he was wrong. Verse 4 says, God brought a great wind on the sea to where the boat was almost sunk. Sailors began to throw cargo over the sides to stabilize the boat. Through all this, Jonah was asleep. All the men called upon their gods to save them to no avail. A lot of people got these fake gods around here, and they start, they start pulling out the crystals. They start pulling out the, the, the Ouija boards. They start pulling out all this other stuff, all this stuff. But at the end of the night, hey, Albert, can you pray? You, yeah, we don't supposed to say, well, what happened to them crystals? What happened to them Ouija boards? What happened? We don't, no, we just need to start praying. You know, finally they found Jonah and, and were surprised that he was asleep. They asked him to call on his God to save them. And then they cast lots to see who brought this on, the bad luck. And guess what? He was up there with him. Now, I know I'm the problem, but I'm, I'm with y'all. Yeah, yeah. Give me one, because we need to find out. You know you're the problem. But, but you up there just as curious as they are. Why is this going on? You know what the problem is. God been talking to you personally, in an audible voice, through other people, through donkeys, through the force. Y'all watch the force. Y'all know. Y'all, he's talking through you through the TV set. Whatever, it's, he's just talking, but you ain't hearing Nathan. Not a zilch. When they realized who he was and that he was running from God, they became afraid. They got afraid for him. Man, what you running from God for like that? Your God is the real God. When they asked him what should they do, he timely told them to throw me over the side of the boat. Now, he probably wouldn't have to say that twice. He causing all the issue. All the issue. So you know, they, they hesitated. They tried harder to row against the storm. But finally, they had no choice. Some of y'all wondering why. You know, I used to have a friend. Check this out. I used to have a friend. This is back in the days when this would be a spot that we would come about 12 o'clock at night. All saw stuff and whatever. Like, anyway, we would go places. We would go places. And I guarantee you, every time we went, we had to fight our way home. Because of him. Every time. They'll run us from Albion every time. <laughs> because of him. And when I finally realized that, 
had to let him go <laughs> when they realized he was and that he was running from God, they became afraid. And he calmly told them, throw me over the side. And Jonah uh, 1 and 13 through 15 says this. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, pray ye. See, so y'all wasn't even listening. It says, we pray. I'm just checking. Oh, Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. They praying to Jonah's God. Do not charge us with innocent blood. We're going to kill this dude, but please don't. Please don't. Oh, Lord, we have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea. And guess what? The sea ceased from its raging. I want you to notice what can happen when you're dealing with a Jonah attitude, whether it's your own or someone else's. In the story, as the waves began to crash over the boat, the first response was to stabilize the boat and make it where it would not sink. The way to do this was to minimize the weight that they were carrying and make the boat a little lighter. To accomplish this goal, they began to throw into the sea their precious cargo. They probably had silver, gold, whatever it was. They, they, it was, they were just throwing it away be, before they threw the man away. That's where some of us are at. We're getting rid of everything else but the issue. We're go, we going around the house hunting. I'm hunting for this. I'm hunting from that. This got to be the thing right here. And God done told you a long time ago, let that go. Let this go. And you're wondering, why is this still happening? Because God knows your heart. And whatever they threw overboard, mind you this, it was all because of Jonah. You know, when you're dealing with a Jonah attitude, it can cause you to lose family, friends, opportunity, job promotion, and other things that you hold dear. A Jonah attitude will not lead you to the blessings of God but actually cost you your blessings. Notice what Jonah was doing while the sailors were throwing the cargo over the side of the boat in an attempt to save the boat. He was sleeping. He was asleep, not even caring that he had put their lives and the li his lives and the, and the lives of the sailor in jeopardy. Some people with Jonah attitudes will suck you dry and still seek more. If you're losing everything because of, the, because of them, they feel that it's okay. They're still benefiting from your loss. Oh, we're getting ready to get juicy now. If you lose all your friends and family because of them, they will not care if you have a, because they have a Jonah attitude. You won't care about those you end up hurting. Well, you may care initially, but you quickly move on. <laughs> oh, my dear. All right. <laughs> Y'all know how that is. I feel, I feel so bad. Okay. How, how's that thing said? Yeah. Not. Not really. Not. Not, I feel bad. Not. 
Put simply, you expect to make sacrifice. You expect people to make sacrifices for you. But now we get to where I was going with this. As Jonah recommended to the sailors, I can recommend this to you. If you have friends and family who may have a Jonah attitude, or if you have that attitude yourself, now listen to me. Cast them over the boat, or cast your attitude over the boat. If you have friends and family, uh, even family with a Jonah attitude, pray for them. Let them go. All right, I know I'm, I'm right in your corner somewhere, so y'all better listen to me. I'm not saying that you should harm them or anything like that, but allow them, or if you allow them to negatively, negatively influence your life, sometimes you have to cast some things and some people off that are not positively influence your life. Let the attitude and people go. Why? If you do not, you will find yourself on the losing end of many things. Now, this is where the casting gets a little sticky. First, you must put your attitude in God's hands before you start casting. You know, I hear a lot of yeah, check yourself before you wreck yourself. You know, I hear a lot of people talking about that, this transitional season. Transition. This is a transition. Transitional season. You hear, you hear it's popular now, a transitional season. Some people like to call it a transitional season, but some of what we are calling transitional season is really, I was wrong, I don't want to apologize, so I'll distance myself and start with people I haven't offended yet season. That's what season it is. It's easier. And once you offend them people, you have another transitional season. You continuously transitioning. When God is telling you to stand your ground, ask for my help, and I'll help get you through whatever situation it is. You can't fix this by yourself. I'm here to help you, and that's the only way we going to fix your attitude is that you allow me to fix it. Because the people that you think may not be the ones that need to go. You know, God has a great plan for you, but you will only be able to fulfill his plan for us when we get our Jonah attitudes out the way. We must also rid ourselves of others with the attitude because of the influence that they may have on us. Many of you have had friends that are no longer in contact with you because they were not good for you. Nope, they caused me to go to jail. They caused me to have bad relationships. They just, Pastor Pryor always, they disturb my righteous and indignation. <laughs> they bring the worst out in me. So you can't hang with them no more. When they in the car with me, all I can hear playing is that song say, bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? When they come for you, I would be better off if I didn't hang with those people. Hang with that woman. Hang with that girl. Whatever it is, if it's bad for you, don't do it. Don't do it.
at some point, you made a decision to move on because you realized that that person was doing you more harm than, than good. And not the way they make you feel. Some of us discount people because they make us feel some kind of way. I don't want to be around them because they make me feel some kind of way. That might be the God in you working. He says, I, if, I, if I don't put turbulence here, you'll never know that you need to get rid of this. So I got all this, every time you come in Timmy's presence, it make you move and fight and do everything else. And when you really start praying, it'll finally go away. Y'all remember what I told y'all? I seen that dude in Walmart, and it was, I was in the lawn and garden, and he was in the grocery department, and I was waving at him like that until I realized, whoop. Take, take my wave back. I ain't wasting my wave on you. <laughs> then God started bringing him closer and closer and closer and closer until finally I had to wait on him. I'm like, Lord, you got jokes. But when I, when I started, and then he kept, do, kept on doing it over and over, over and over, over and over again. And find, I'm good now. I'm good now. I can, I can hang out with him. I, you know, I was worried about my pride, my, my everything else, but I let God do it because I had to pray every time I was in his presence. Every time. From across Walmart, you know, that's a long way. <clears throat> to taking my way back to him having to pay me for doing service for somebody else Pull out a big old knot of money, and that's why me and him fell out in the first place, because of stacks. And he pull out more money than the law allow you to carry around in your pocket to pay me. And he peeling them off like bang, bang, bang. And I'm, Lord, help me. You got to pray. You can't just run from every situation. When, this, when the sailors face, uh, were faced with the decision to cast Jonah off, they tried their best to find a way to secure the boat without throwing him off. However, they finally came to the point where they had to make a decision and cast him off. Once Jonah hit the water, the wind stopped blowing, the waves stopped crashing against the boat, and everything was calm. When you identify people in your life with a Jonah attitude and you begin to realize that they are sucking you dry, you come to realize that you have to make some tough decisions. When the sailors saw, saw what happened, they cast Jonah over. They were immediately overcome with fear of the Lord and offered him a sacrifice. What, with their sacrifice, they also made a vow. We are not told in the story what those vows or that sacrifice was, but I would think that it would make some serious promises about their beliefs. They were almost killed, and they had interactions with the real God after having prayed to their pagan God with no success. They became, they became very aware of who the real God was, and I believe that it left a lasting impression. When you take control of your life and get rid of your Jonah attitudes as well as those you hang around with the same attitudes, peace will come into your life. It will take some time for you to realize it, but the peace will come. If we could all stand. Now, I, put them, I meant to put this disclaimer out there before I even spoke the message. Um, I love people. And I love music. I love helping people become better versions of themselves. To recognize that this walk with God is not an easier walk. 
It's not full of a whole bunch of rules and regulations. Better not do this, better not go there, better not touch this, better not smell that, better not look at this, better not do that. Better not, better not, better not, because that's what turns people off in Christ, because they think it's a whole bunch of better nots, can'ts, won'ts, do not enters, and it's a whole bunch of getting your mind right. Recognizing God as your Lord and Savior. Trying to do your best without coming to the idea that I ain't going to do it. Do it for the vine. I ain't going to do it. Yet God speaks to us all the time. And sometimes we feel some kind of way when God is telling us to do something and we want to push against him. He ain't going to make you do it. But that's where you're going to start missing heaven by that 16 inches. Head knowledge and your heart. You know, so I just want you to pray this prayer with me and then we can depart. But when you say this prayer, I want you to know this is all you need to do to make sure you have that ticket when that train, bus, sleigh that takes you to heaven comes to your door. It's going to come. I don't, mean, I don't care how many times that you beat whatever sickness. I don't care. It's going to come. None of the people back in the biblical days that are living now. There's no Lazarus walking around us now. So it's going to come for you, 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 and you, and myself. And the only thing we can do is prepare our lives to do that. And it ain't about saying, well, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do this. What do you do? Do you love the Lord? So, in all sincerity, I want you to... Clear your mind out and say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died for my sins and that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my Lord and Savior. And follow him. From this day forward, guide my life. Help me to do your will. And Lord, we thank you for the grace to forgive those who have sinned against us. I pray this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.